Hey everybody, welcome to another episode on Iron Man Hacks. Today I'm really happy to be speaking with Dr. Jeffrey Dermer, who is a sleep expert, physician, um, medical doctor, as well as he worked with the U.S. Olympic weightlifting team, uh, all about sleep. Maybe you could introduce yourself and tell us a bit about what you've done. Sure. Thanks, Andrew. Um, thanks for having me here, first of all. Uh, it's always good to talk to a new audience, and triathlon uh, uh, athletes are a sort of a new audience for me in, in some ways, but uh, I definitely talk to a lot of distance athletes, so this is, this is a great uh, avenue. So my background, I'm a neurologist. Uh, uh, that's my MD side, um, and I'm a neuroscientist. That's my PhD side, and um, worked in academics for most of my career, in major universities uh, like University of Pennsylvania, Emory University. Um, and I actually started um, recognizing through my research um, in uh, looking at um, the, the functions of sleep and wake in the brain of animals, um, that this is something that we could directly apply to humans. And there's a lot of data and has been a lot of research over the last hundred years in the sleep and circadian neurobiology realm. So uh, my job as an MD PhD is to take things and translate them into practice. It's the bench to bedside construct. And that's what I started doing in uh, my academic work, uh, looking at uh, folks that had sleep disorders like restless leg syndrome and um, sleep disordered breathing, a number of conditions, but then also looking at performance and the changes in um, cognitive ability uh, as well as physical ability. Um, and personally, as an athlete myself, I mean, I grew up as an athlete my whole life and actually went to uh, D1 schools on scholarships <laughs> for things like rowing um, and then became a, a, a more of a national team rower after, after college. It, it really appealed to me that there, there must be a significant physical benefit to sleep or we wouldn't be doing it every night as a species and all these other species that sleep. And so far we haven't found one that doesn't, by the way, <laughs> um, including trees, including plants. Um, they all have what we call quiescent periods. That, that, that must be some sort of an advantage to us physically, mentally, emotionally. Um, and so I started studying the impact of sleep loss and sleep deprivation. And lo and behold, um, there's just a wasn't much data about what the impact was on athletes in particular. And that really started my interest in that area and working with athletes. Um, and uh, while I was at Emory University, I had the opportunity to work with um, the Atlanta Falcons professional football team uh, here in the U.S. And um, also with a number of other uh, elite athletes in the swimming realm. Uh, my kids were all uh, are all we're all D1 swimmers and, and uh, we're on national teams and things. Uh, in their their days, and actually realized that a lot of their problems were related to their early wake up times and going to school, and then having second practices in the afternoons and being sleep deprived. And so I worked with the coaches um, in uh, the Dynamo Swim program uh, in Atlanta, where we lived at the time, to really improve um, some of those metrics around sleep and wake. And lo and behold, we saw significant benefits, not just in the pool, but also in behaviors <laughs> in high school kids, which was uh, um, a major, major benefit. So it really got me interested in, in applying what we knew from the science into populations like uh, athletes. And um, in, the last, uh, in the last few years, last three or four years now, I've been working with the U.S. Olympic team, in particular the weightlifting team uh, that brought me in to help organize travel, but also to organize um, training programs that would accentuate uh, wake-based performance drive within the brain and bodies of, of um, Olympic level athletes. It seems yeah. that most triathletes and act actually cyclists and runners, everybody loves coffee. Not everybody, but a lot of people do, uh, especially athletes. And now, you know, it's, it's the one stimulant that's, that's not a drug. I mean, it's a drug in a way, but it's, sure. uh, it's, it's appropriately, you know, it's allowed and it's not a, a doping mm -hmm. drug, right? So it's the one thing that everybody says, if you don't take it, before a race and you know yeah. if you don't use it then you're you're foregoing something that you know it's a free free speed basically free performance um that's the thinking right but what's your opinion on caffeine both in the context of how it relates to sleep like right. uh, before sleep obviously but also as a training stimulant you know so like we have the yeah. we have all the drinks the gels all this stuff that have caffeine in them that we try yeah. to take and when you're out on the bike for six hours for eight hours or doing a 12-hour iron man 
how much caffeine can you take in and how does right. that even help you? Yeah, I'm afraid there's going to be a suntan lotion with caffeine next. Um, so the, the, there probably is. Oh, God, it was a bad idea. Don't take that idea and run with it. Um, yeah. So, again, this is first off, let's start off. What is caffeine? Oh, by the way, I found a spray, a caffeine spray a few weeks God, ago. Really? Yeah. OK, so it's not a drug, but we have all kinds of delivery routes. I'll tell you one thing. It is a drug. Number one, it is absolutely a drug because it works in your central nervous system. And what it does is it inactivates, inhibits uh, a little chemical called adenosine. And adenosine, if you remember basic biology, is part of building DNA, right? Adenosine is what is the A and the ATP, um, adenosine triphosphate. Uh, you need ATP, right? It's like yep, your that's a basic mitochondria. Basic that's your energy yeah. source, cellular energy. energy. Kind of important for a triathlete, right? So, <laughs> or any athlete. So adenosine is something that is part of the metabolic process. You, you cleave DNA, you cleave uh, adenosine from, or, or phosphates from adenosine triphosphate to make adenosine diphosphate and monophosphate and free adenosine. That's how the process works. And so over the course of a day, adenosine accumulates in your body and your brain. Adenosine receptors, adenosine one and two receptors, live in different parts of the brain and they detect the rising level of adenosine throughout the day, which is why it activates sleep at a certain concentration in a part of the anterior hypothalamus called the ventral lateral preoptic area, which you don't need to know about. But the idea is that your central nervous system is monitoring this metabolite. And it's sort of the homeostat in your brain, you know, as you're building up adenosine, it turns on the sleep switch and adenosine goes back down. And the next day it does the same thing. So it's like a, a homeostat. It's like a thermometer or thermostat in your house. When you take caffeine, you inhibit that process. You inhibit the adenosine signal that signals sleepiness. Um, so it, it has a very specific biological effect in the central nervous system that actually shuts down uh, sleep systems, shuts, shuts down the sleep system itself. And that's why if you take caffeine, we typically drink it in the morning, right? And the reason we typically drink it in the morning is not just because it's a hot beverage that was sold to us by uh, a Brazilian company back in the seventies. It's because the adenosine, uh, the, the anti-adenosine effect of caffeine is most pronounced in the morning when you have a little adenosine hanging around, causing that little sleep inertia that you, you have because everybody wakes up with a little adenosine around and you got to kind of wake yourself up to go. Well, you take that caffeine, it inhibits that adenosine and all of a sudden you're fully awake. So it's, it's helpful in that regard. And it has this specific biological effect. The other thing that caffeine does is it activates a part of the nervous system that you don't have much control over the sympathetic and, par and the sympathetic nervous system. You do have some control over it. And actually it's one of the things that a lot of athletes and yogis and folks try to do is to try to uh, be able to activate and deactivate their autonomic nervous systems to some degree. But when you put caffeine in the mix, it throws the balance way off into the activation of sympathetic nervous system, which is also why people look at it as a pregame to their performance because activating sympathetic nervous system is what improves oxygen utility, blood flow, all of the other things that make your physical performance better. The problem with it is that it, in, your, in the normal course of, of training, it throws you into a sympathetic charge balance as well as an awake balance that is very hard to get out of and get natural parasympathetic activation for sleep and for digestion and for a lot of the other things that you need to, uh, need to do. So a little caffeine in the morning, not a problem. It's going to help you with that wake response. It's part of that, the circadian timing as well. It activates the circadian timing response. But if you're using it all the time, you're going to see its effect first off, not be as much. You'll, it'll, stop to, it'll stop working because the adenosine receptors will adjust to having caffeine around all the time. And it will also throw your system of sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, autonomic activity off. So you'll start to lose the ability to calm yourself, which actually is far more significant in the face of, of athletic performance than it is to arouse yourself. The, that sense of right. fear that that's, you get before really, a race. Think yeah, about yeah. that. That's yeah, what you so, want to be able to control. And you're losing right. that ability with over, overactive sympathetic nervous system. Right. It's not what I've always been hearing. And, and I've read 
about the fact that I don't know. It sounds like my understanding is not the same as what you're telling me that you cannot build a tolerance to caffeine. That's not what you just said. Is that true? You can build a tolerance to, yes, you can. So if you, if you drink caffeine all the time and our truck yeah. drivers do this, by the way, <laughs> yeah. I also take care of truck drivers, another, another professional athlete that's not recognized. That's a very hard job. Um, truck drivers drink, you know, 32 ounce drink oh, huge, uh, right? caffeinated yeah. beverages all the time. That's just part of being on the road, right? They have to have fluids, but what they do is they caffeinate their fluids. So they're not just drinking coffee. They're drinking sodas. They're drinking energy drinks. They're drinking all this stuff with the hope that it's going to keep them awake. And all it's doing is driving their sympathetic nervous system and driving their heart and driving the things that look like wakefulness because the adenosine system in the, in the brain has readjusted itself to the environment of having an, in, a, an inhibitor in front of it constantly. Right. This happens all the time in other nervous system uh, neurotransmitter systems. We see it with dopamine. So dopamine levels, if you give somebody a dopamine antagonist, which is used for things like schizophrenia and a number of mental health disorders, over the course of time, dopamine receptors downregulate and something called tardive dyskinesia occurs where they can't control their movements and see a lot of mouth and facial movements and they don't get better because the dopamine system adjusted. So the adenosine system is not quite as active as the dopamine system, but it has a similar uh, impact and you don't want to overtrain your, your adenosine system by using caffeine all the time. In fact, a good buddy of mine, um, who actually is from I think, your hometown in Eugene, Oregon, uh, he's a, he's a surgeon, a buddy of mine from medical school, um, climber, uh, skier, surfer, outdoor kind of guy. Um, he, uh, he's a surgeon and he looks at surgery as a physical performance as, as right. it is. It's also an intellectual performance, but he didn't use caffeine unless he intended to use the caffeine. In other words, he avoided caffeine at all other times, except when he needed it or wanted it to improve his performance. And so he looked at it as a performance enhancing drug. And honestly, if used properly, it's a legal one, but you have to use it properly. If you overuse it, it will not help you. I, I think it's actually really important for people to realize that um, caffeine is something that is ubiquitous now that was not in the 1960s. It was not as ubiquitous as we have it now. And that's because it was a part of our culture that changed and that we are replacing sleep with a chemical um, that helps us to avoid sleep. And the performance benefits uh, of caffeine, and there are some, absolutely. We see it with the military. It's part of, a, we use many different um, chemicals to, to help our military perform under high stress environments. And, you know, one of the things that I, I've found to be really helpful is to tell people, try not drinking your caffeine, try not drinking alcohol, try just sleeping more and see how your workouts feel, not your races, your workouts, not how well you did, not the number. How did it feel? That's right. a different thing. It's like our your perception, our, our, not your our time. Perception. Exactly. And that's, this is something I've seen improving, uh, improved a lot of rowers in my day was our, our coach was like, the feel of the boat is what you're trying to get to. You're trying to replicate the feel of the boat under you. You're not trying to just, we're not just shooting for a time. There are definitely workouts where you're doing that, but the, the real work is done in order to get the feel of ease. And that's when you're fast. The, the, feel and then the time will be the result pain. of that later. The exactly. time is a byproduct of that. You got it. Exactly. So if you can, if you can reduce caffeine, reduce alcohol, it, get the necessary time of sleep and make sure your timing and quality are good. If you need help with quality, you certainly can talk to physicians and they'll help you with that. Uh, sleep disorder, sleep physicians in particular. But once you've done that, I, I guarantee you that how your workouts feel will change dramatically. You, and you'll start to think, why do I even need these things? Why, why am I being sold all these pre-workout stimulants? And, uh, and why do I need all these gels and suntan lotions with caffeine in them? You don't. That's the thing. You really don't. I because see. I once see. you learn to feel what you're doing, it changes your performance. That's so really you're, by, you're, you're basically bypassing all those quick fixes and all those uh, 
all those, you know, band-aids and you're getting to the heart of it and, and really adapting how you should be. And I presume if you feel better, you can perform more, you can do more mentally exactly. and psychologically and physiologically, you're in a much better state to push yourself when you're in the race and actually actually okay. win that race because you're not feeling like, oh man, this is this is hard. Because like you yeah. said, your rate of preserved exertion or your perception of it is going to be uh, lower. And therefore your mental, because we all know how, how strong the mental side is, right? And if you can push yourself. Yeah. So yeah. that's, a, that's yeah. really cool. Yeah. I, it's getting back to the basic principles, of how your body and brain work. I mean, if, if you use a lot of other things and a lot of people sell stuff to us, right? <laughs> Those are temporary, as you said, band-aids. They are not um, long-term strategies. And, you know, we use this stuff with military folks and they go into combat with caffeine pills and they go in with provigil pills and they go in with, but that's not normal human behavior <laughs> and right. and we want them to live it's not a, a matter of a sport um so yeah we pull out all the stops in those situations but they're very temporary too it's like they're the not, Ger german methamphetamine soldiers yeah, it's like okay exactly. you're gonna die anyway but we want to win the war so just whatever yeah, exactly so <laughs> it, it, really we can't take every situation and apply it to athletics because you're looking at your natural body's ability and your brain's ability and your, your psychology to do a, to perform better each time. Um, you, I would hate to hear that I did better this time because I drank caffeine. Yeah. I, that would, that would be, I'd, I'd, I'd be depressed as an athlete <laughs> to feel that okay. my performance okay. is related to my, my chemicals. So you've given me a completely new perspective. The, the typical thinking with triathletes and with endurance athletes, as I'm sure you know, and what I hear and what I've heard from people I respect, people who, are, who, know, who know the sport, who know medicine even, are always saying, you know, you have to take caffeine. Not you don't have to, but why wouldn't you take caffeine? Maybe in a race, it's a different, a different scenario. Yeah. You, you probably wouldn't disagree with that, would you? Like, okay, you're, you're no. finally, you finally made it to the world champs take the caffeine, do whatever you have to do and do well in the race. But in your general nine months of training. Yeah. I'd say yes. Unless it's not something you normally, unless you have good control over your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. I, I really think that, you know, caffeine gives you a temporary boost in terms of acceleration, in terms of acuity, but it's temporary. If you're going, remember, caffeine itself has a limited window of, of activity in most people, especially those who use it regularly. If you use it regularly, it doesn't work that long. It doesn't have that much of an effect. If you don't use it very often, it can have up to eight hours of an effect. And that's one of the reasons we tell people not to drink caffeine in the afternoon if they have insomnia because it's hanging around causing problems. It's very important to look at all of these um, you know, performance related um, techniques uh, as adjunctive to your training. It's not part of your training. It's adjunctive. Right. You can add right. it and see what it does for you. It honestly, it could throw you off. It could make your heart rate too high. It could make you, your breathing too shallow. It could change a lot of the other physiology that you relied on from your own training. And again, it's the feel. If you, if you're, if you've got the right feel, that's why we all have this ability to, to use vision and, and, and have the ability to like foresee what we're about to go into. And if you can envision that before you do it, you can manifest what, what you think is about to happen. It gets your body into the sense and feeling that you want to be in for the performance. And it's really not those other chemicals that you might add, um, you know, whether that's caffeine, melatonin, or anything else over the counter. Uh, that you think might help. It's it's really about uh, getting the feel of of how you you should be when you're ready to perform well. So that visualization and that that sort of like uh, rehearsal of it, which which I think most yeah. most athletes are know about doing right. Imagine yourself yeah. doing this, this, and this is is perhaps much more valuable. Than oh, far more valuable. I, th that's far more valuable. So is uh, meditation and right. learning to to utilize the parasympathetic nervous system. I mean, if you look at, um, I don't know if anybody knows the book, breathe, uh, breathe by, uh, John Esther, but the idea that, you know, deep sea divers or folks that do free diving and have these the competitions that go for four or five minutes without oxygen, that's a parasympathetic activity in a sympathetic, um, uh, situation. 
where you have to perform, which is sympathetic nervous system, but you need parasympathetic control of your breathing. If you think about that, um, you know, the more we can start to manipulate our parasympathetic and sympathetic responses naturally, rather than with exogenous input, um, right. the better you are at performing. It's, because that's who you are. That's a physiological yeah. instead of external, yeah. uh, you know, it's autonomously controlled as opposed to like, Hey, yeah. I just took a, I just injected something and now I'm superhuman, yeah. but that's yeah, not you who to, you are. Is it? No. Just, if you want to uh, blood dope and add extra oxygen carrying capacity to your body, you can do that. That's why it's be like everyone else. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. You too can join the club. Very cool. Um, Dr. Germer, I really appreciate the time you, you you've given me. Um, it's, sure. uh, I think it's extremely insightful. And I think the discussion on caffeine is something that I'm going to have to uh, cut up as an individual video because it's, it's something that so many people are going to need to understand and reframe their thinking around because it's, you know, it's more like, hey, caffeine's a, a part of who we are. But now let's look at it from a different angle and yeah. see it as a, yeah. Yeah. Well, culturally, you know, coffee is, is, is our, uh, the North American version of chewing coca leaves. It's, <laughs> it's what we do. And, you know, and, and Asian. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and your, your and wife Prado is a Tika, right? Else. Yeah. My wife's a Tika. So yeah. I, I, I lived there for a few months in high school. So oh, really? cool. um, yeah, the well, family yeah. I lived with had a huge coffee plantation in their backyard and you know, yes, that's, my, my wife's family has coffee uh, plants as, as well. And it, it's a, it's part of the culture. So like kids drink coffee, but it's social. It's not right. meant for performance. It's a, right. it's social. Um, it's a different, it has different meanings for different people. For sure.